Thank you, Luis. It's a, um, it's always a unique opportunity to have the uh, have the. Uh, uh, opportunity to, to probe a co-author a little bit um, as I've uh, engaged with you in many dialogues uh, on some of these ideas um, and also been thinking about collectively with you uh, how one can interpret federalism and the future of federalism in India uh, as, um, as our political landscape is also going through such a crucial transition. But let me start with asking you um, to talk to us a little bit more about the federal idea as uh, as it existed in 1950, um, and uh, you know you, you did mention uh, and and you talk about that of course in your book as well. Um, you know the, the the context and background in which federalism or, or the federal idea sort of found uh, uh, took root in India uh, it pushed us in the direction of a quasi federal structure. One which, in unlike many other parts of the world, had a fairly strong centralizing backbone. Uh, but at the same time, that federalism was seen as an essential element of what would bring together this very diverse uh, nation and was a tool through which accommodation um, uh, could be achieved. So let me push you a little bit. Did we, did we in our constitution think of federalism much more as a tool to nation building or uh, was there the roots of a genuine imagination of federalism as core to what the idea of India was? Very nice question and um, takes, me, takes me into um, some of the other historical research I've been doing recently mm -hmm. on, on the origins of federalism um, and also the origins of India's welfare regime. Um, I think for a long time, we have, or the scholarship on, on Indian federalism has um, somehow uh, existed, and, and for very good reasons, but existed under the shadow of partition. Um, and so the assumption is that um, the, the constituent assembly deliberately avoided a more full-throttled embrace of um, a federal idea. Um, such that it existed in, in the mid-20th century um, because of a primary concern for building a, a nation but also building a civic conception of a nation um, and one uh, in which um, political life would, would focus more at the national than at the parochial or local levels. Um, so, so there was a, you know, a, a, a kind of... A, a, Especially, in, especially for Nehru, uh, a kind of a, a kind of intrinsically centralising idea of federalism um, that that informed his approach to the constitution, um, and in some of the other work I've been doing recently, I've I've tried to tried to move beyond partition um, as the kind of critical moment at which federalism was born to also look at the ideas that were circulating and that were very influential in the design of the constitution um, around how a new national economy should be built. Um, and so what um, India's nationalist leadership, what the constituent assembly and indeed uh, important voices such as um, B.R. Ambedkar's, um, what, what um, was also at stake in this period was not only the building of a national polity but a national economy. Um, and this entailed a process of national economic integration um, between um, parts of, of the country that have been governed either as British provinces or as, as princely states um, in which industrial development had not, in any sense, um, been guided by a proactive industrial policy um, by the colonial government at the centre. Um, and this had given rise to a very fierce, and I talked about the idea of competitive federalism just now, but given rise to a very fierce form of interprovincial, interregional economic competition 
um, that was quite damaging um, to many of the older centers, especially of the, the textile industry in Bombay. Um, and so there's a very um, different um, set of influences on, on Indian federalism, and especially on some of the um, measures of concurrency of the forms of interdependence that we see in the empowering of the central government that also come out of an attempt to bring together, bring India together as a national market, um, as a market in which um, labour and capital would be subject to a kind of common industrial relations regime with a kind of national pattern of um, labour regulation um, and a national industrial policy. And of course, you know, that was a, 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 a kind of a, a one of Nehru's main priorities. So the, the kind of the forms of centralism um, that exist in the constitution um, owe much to these parallel projects, both of building the national um, uh, a sense of nation as a political entity, but also as an economic entity. And in important ways, they diverted from a kind of classic conception of federalism. Um, and that is the reason why you know, federalism doesn't appear as a term in, in the constitution. Um, that all said, um, I think that uh, there were other ways in which uh, a, kind of a, a, a notion that India was so diverse that um, it, you know, that, that it would, that it, that it was inconceivable that you could, that you could design a form of government that did not um, delineate separate spheres of. Um, of autonomy and jurisdiction for, um, for its regions. And of course, the identity of those regions has changed over time. Um, but something of a kind of a more normative idea of what we might think of federalism, I think, was implicit to that understanding of how um, a diverse nation could be, could be held together. Um, I think that, the, that, that federalism as an idea, though, um, has, has developed over time. Um, so I think it I think it has it has come to look quite different to um, the the kind of moment of, of constitution making and constitutional promulgation in 1950. But in so many ways, um, the the present moment reflects precisely these debates, uh, and and precisely I think for the sake of argument, although if you push me, I'd say I think this is where I stand on it. But um, th there seems to be a the, the old ambivalence of, towards federalism seems to now become have become even more pronounced, um, and because you see the in this in this current present moment of politics where we are redefining um, uh, nationalism, uh, the notion of a one nation uh, has become almost central to that narrative, and 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 in in you know different parts of. Uh, the state and the market are uh, being used as tools. So you need to have one nation, one tax. You need to have one nation, one market. There's a certain, uh, the, the, the narrative of the economy and the narrative of the state and the uh, linked to the idea of efficiency gives credibility to this notion that we need to emerge now as one nation. Also because we are now confident that a lot of the uh, accommodation that was needed in the early part of our post-independent history ought to have been achieved. Uh, and if not, we'll just force it through. And therefore, uh, we, can, uh, we can now be much more explicit about our federal ambivalence uh, in terms of the, of the core normative idea of federalism. And we'll come to cooperative and competitive federalism in a moment. Mm. But um, are we, I mean, in some, you have argued that uh, Given the particular political moment, uh, elements of the constitution that were centralizing, which enabled more accommodation in the past, are now being, the very same tools are being used to enable more centralization. Uh, but let me push you and say, is it because we have agreed that the normative idea of federalism never really took root and that one nation is the core? Would that be a fair way of, of interpreting the present moment? It's a, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's, as much of that I would agree with. Um, I think, though, we, I mean, I, I think the answer or the um, feelings that um, 
that, that the confident kind of embrace of one nationism invokes might look very different in, in if we were sitting in Chennai um, than, than Delhi um, today or potentially many other um, parts of, of, of the Federation. I think um, certainly in terms of the, the kind of constitutional structures of, of, of federalism and some of the ambivalence that is inherent um, in, in, the, in India's federal history, um, we have some of the answers as to why what seemed such well-settled tenets of accommodation um, and approaches to accommodating diversity, why some of those um, tenets seem to have been relatively easy to unsettle again. Um, right. But so we could have gone the other way of saying, let's get deeper federalism now that we are confident rather than more centralization. Mm, yeah, yeah. But also that I think we are yet to really see what the the kind of political possibilities of um, or challenges to uh, a much more unitary conception of India are. I think that those are only starting to take shape now. And where do you see linguistic federalism uh, as playing a role there? Because there was a brief moment, in fact, ironically, uh, I, the, the day I was presenting a paper that we both written together uh, was uh, that morning uh, our Home Minister had, uh, I think, flirted with the possibility of linguistic unity and talked about Hindi being the national language. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the tensions of linguistic federalism and whether that could actually emerge as a fault line um, that would, because he flirted with it and has now stepped back. So how central has that been to our federal history and mm. how central do you see that as remaining uh, in, in the evolution of our federal futures? Yes, I mean, I, I saw that intervention by Amit Shah and then the very quick rolling back as being something as what we might describe as dog whistle politics. It was a kind of, it was a, it was a kind of momentary blast that um, spoke to a particular audience that might like to, to hear that, um, and then a, a kind of a, a, a reversal um, to, you know, kind of reassure people that we're not going to move that quickly to, to um, unsettle this linguistic compromise. But I think um, it is. You know, absolutely crucial, really, to, to see how important the compromise over language has been to the stability of Indian federalism. Both, of course, the fact of the reorganisation of state boundaries along linguistic lines, but also um, the compromise over the national language. Um, and had both those things not been conceded by the 1960s, I think we would have um, we would we would have seen a very different history of um, centre state relations, especially with um, southern Indian states. Um, and and uh, and and so you know I think there are a number of um, kind of uh, line a number of um, things that are likely to come together, both linguistic federalism, but also um, what will, I'm sure, be a renewed debate about fiscal federalism in light of the Finance Commission recommendations um, that are likely to reactivate um, some of the concerns about um, the direction, the kind of, uh, 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 this, this very pronounced shift towards a much more one nation conception of federalism, um, especially since um, the, this year's Lok Sabha elections. Let's talk a little bit, since you, since you brought up fiscal federalism, uh, also talk a little bit about the institutional landscape of federalism that has seen uh, quite a significant set of shifts over the last five or six years, some uh, coincidentally, some as necessary changes, but all of which seem to be reshaping um, the dynamics of center-state relations. So, you know, that includes uh, importantly the shift towards one tax so GST and without getting into the complexity of GST itself but the idea of, uh, of the GST and, and the institutional arrangements around it, uh, the planning commission uh, 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 which long symbolized everything that was wrong with India's centralized economy uh, to, to welcome a new form of the Niti Ayo, which in many ways represents the, the sort of market-based federal idea that, that, that you were talking about as well. Um, uh, and that alongside with the brief moment of the 14th Finance Commission, which is at least trying to deepen uh, fiscal federalism, how do you see these institutional shifts having played out over the last uh, uh, few years? Um, and uh, also linked to that, what about the old established institutions like the governor, the Rajasabha, 
um, that were all meant to create fora for negotiation and genuine cooperation. Um, you know, I, I think everybody in this room has uh, probably fairly for strong views on, on the functioning of these institutions. Mm -hmm. But if you could talk to us a little bit about this landscape of institutional shaping of center state dynamics. Yes, so I mean, there has been a lot of institutional change um, in a very short period of time. Um, some of which, like the GST, has been a long time um, in the making. Um, but uh, institutional shifts that have quite profound consequences um, in ways that I think we're, we're yet still to see. So um, on, on the uh, fiscal front, especially the creation of the GST Council, which I think is already emerging and will, um, will continue to be um, another um, uh, political forum in which the states um, will in different constellations work together and seek to either work with or oppose the, the center. Um, but within a structure that impels um, coordination between the center and the states and that prevents the emergence of um, a, a, a regional block versus the center. Um, and so it is in important ways the GST council strengthens that cooperative um, dimension of federalism and the, the interdependence of, of the centre and the states. Um, I think the dismantling of the Planning Commission um, and the, its replacement with the Nityayog um, and uh, in many ways the, the kind of continued functioning of you know, the, the way in which the Rajya Sabha functions um, less as a space for upholding um, a, a kind of upholding the rights of states or, a, or reflecting a more territorial dimension of, of India's polity, but more as a, as a kind of upper chamber, um, the, the kind of the counterpart to the Lok Sabha, really um, underline, I think, some of the um, weaknesses in the architecture of intergovernmental relations um, in India. There have been many other... Um, bodies that have, have attempted to stand in that space, the Interstate Council, the National Development um, uh, Corporation. Um, but um, the, 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 the relative weakness of these spaces as well-institutionalized spaces for managing that center-state relationship um, in, in many ways um, strengthen the... Uh, kind of the permeability, if you like, or the, the, the vulnerability of Indian federalism to shift as the political climate shifts, because political parties have stood in for um, institutional devices and in, in, in that um, intergovernmental space um, for, for a long time. Um, the, the, the kind of fiscal picture you know, is a slightly different story and, and what, what might be a kind of, we, we might come to see the 14th Finance Commission as more of a, an exception rather than a, a kind of a, 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 a moment of, um, a, a kind of period of continuity. Um, but there was, and I think that, you know, also reflects that the time that the 14th Finance Commission was reporting, um, we were, you know, India was still... Um, inhabiting or moving away, moving out of this period of much greater regional um, political and economic autonomy. Um, and so the, 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 the enhancement to fiscal decentralization, the, the fairly substantial, at least um, on paper, increase in, in, fis in, the, in the share of the taxes received by, share of central taxes received by the states, um, responded to the political power of the states to demand greater fiscal space. Um, uh, and, of course, the 15th Finance Commission, whose report will come out in a matter of days or weeks, um, is um, operating within quite a different um, political context. Well, uh, just one last question before we open it up, links to the political context. I think uh, it's sort of become common... Uh, commonly accepted to think of the 1990s and the 2000s as this, you know, the period of deepening of regional politics, uh, as a sign of deepening of federalism. You yourself have talked about you know, some imagination of a linear progression and regional, regional politics was a sign of that. But federal institutions are also shaped by party politics. And if you look across the party system, the competitive political party landscape is deeply centralized. Every single political party, regional or national, operates in a very, very centralized structure. 
Uh, and there seems to be a contradiction here. Was it even viable for us to go down the road of deeper federalism with a party system that is deeply centralized? And I think we see elements of that contradiction very much in our completely, I would go so far as to say, failed experiment with the 73rd and 74th Amendment, where states have done everything within their power uh, to undermine uh, the constitutionally assigned roles to, to these key institutions. So in a sense, Again, was that were we overplaying our imagination of federalism, or overplaying the idea that federalism was beginning to take root as a normative idea uh, in that phase, um, and now we are just seeing a return to the to to, to where we began from? Yes, I mean the the, the kind of the, the failed experiment of of decentralisation to the third tier, of course, is another part of the story of federalism that. Um, that I don't develop so much in this book, but I think um, decentralization to, um, to the third tier can be quite consistent with a centralizing model of federalism, especially where it helps to um, provide a direct channel of, 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 of communication between the central government and, um, and panchayats. Um, yet the states obviously play and continue, have played a, a kind of crucial intermediary role there in, in determining exactly how panchayats um, would operate, with some, you know, with some conditions. I mean, the states had a little bit less scope to manoeuvre, for instance, in the role of the panchayats in implementing Narega, for instance. Um, but um, you know. Uh, there is, I mean, in kind of the, where you started in the question, the kind of is is you know is centralisation so deeply entrenched in in the political imagination and the structure of political parties, um, and even in the imaginary of of, of voters, um, you know, there's there's you know quite persuasive survey data that would suggest yeah. in, in comparative international terms that, um, that, the in, that the average Indian voter um, would prefer strong centralised leadership, whether that's strong national centralised leadership or strong leadership at the state level, which is also um, one of the major trends that we saw even in the era of political regionalisation, the emergence of strong centralised leaders at the state level. Um, so there is something about... Um, the, the the kind of democratic consolidation, you know, in a context of, um, in a, in, a, in a context of social and economic development, which which um, has produced a kind of particular proclivity for um, central authority, um, but uh, but with with balances, um, so you know, strong cent strong regional centres of political authority have been a check on the authority of political power at the centre. Um, the, uh, you know, we don't have to lose sight of a normative idea of what federalism might entail. Um, just because we see a shift in, in the political climate, it can still be true that linguist, you know, linguistic federalism remains fundamental to the way that very many Indians see their, their identity and manage you know, the, 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 kind of the, 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 the multiple identities that they hold as individual citizens. Um, so you know, I think, as with so much else, the, the, the idea of India is, is you know, is, is, um, we're in a particular moment of contestation over the idea of India, and with that, the idea of um, of the nation, um, and um, and of course, federalism com comes into play there. But I think we shouldn't lose sight of the diversity of um, of of views that continue to shape the idea of what it means to be Indian. So. Thank you. It's tempting to monopolise you for the rest <laughs> of the afternoon, but I'm sure lots of people have questions. So. Uh, opening it up, and we can just move the mic around. Mm -hmm. You can start. <laughs> in nationalism and in federalism, these are all synonymous. Uh, but we, we move a little ahead, and we talk of socialism, communism, find the socialism democracy is playing the lead role in the North Europe 
and there the people are more or less uh, <coughs> satisfied and content. Whereas if you look up the democracy in South America and other countries, the rampant corruption and uh, political instability and uh, maybe some other reasons, unemployment and economic reasons, we find uh, this is not very successful. So how far uh, we have come to a stage of federalism, but where corruption, nepotism, tapism <coughs> is uh, rampant. And uh, do you find that which part of uh, socialism, capitalism, or Indian federalism, or UK federalism, or US federalism, how far uh, you can go and explain us that this is one of the best and the priority set for any nation to grow economically? It's a big question. <laughs> Uh, just taking on uh, uh, Yami's point on uh, centralization ingrained in our political imagination, mm. both I think uh, political activists or politicians survey data suggests that such kind of centralization is in citizenry, and because our constitution is sort of like also based on Government of India Act 1935, which it itself was a very centralizing mm. document. Given that we have that framework, which means uh, like there is a hegemonic idea of that imagination of the nation, right? So we started with one hegemonic idea in 1950s. Uh, in 60s, you see some sort of like regional identity assertion, which was basically on the lines of language and caste, and we saw breaking down of that national like basically the centralizing model and you, you when you reach in the 80s and 90s you see the of federalism mm -hmm. and now in 2010s we basically getting back to another hegemonic idea now the question for me is if this hegemonic idea is going to remain there for some time it will de develop internal contradictions there would be some opposition but given that language and caste card has already been used where is the new assertion going to come from there was a question here. So, my name is Vasili, and I'm doing the PhD under Professor Rika Saxena. And my question is, so, so federalism is not just a, a like fixed idea in the constitution, but it is expanding day by day, and it is in a continuous process. It's a continuous process. So, by saying that, uh, do you think instead, or just talking about, or maybe if not deepening of the idea, isn't it also lesser federalization at some point of time and greater federalization with another event then states going away from some federal idea at some point of time for example like this is what i feel odisha it talks about its own policies which are quite distinct and different from the national policies so don't you think instead of federalism taking its root lesser federalism greater federalism or states shifting here and there from the idea of federalism isn't it happening when it comes to linear federal experience? Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to take one more or do you want to respond and then we it's do like another? Yep. Yeah. Okay, go for it. <laughs> so, so, just taking forward the idea of future of federalism, um, a lot of research has shown that often the way that governments tend to become transparent is when there's a bad shock to the system. So, like a scam or something. So, even the Lokpal, the corruption movement came from a big shock to the system. I'm just wondering whether you foresee in terms of future of federalism of India, we do have a lot of shocks coming, whether it's economy, um, in what direction, I guess what would it take to go back to a less centralized form of federalism, if you're thinking about the future of federalism, given, I guess, other countries and other contexts that you study as well. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Um. So there's a lot going on in these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering where to start. Um, Rahul, uh, maybe I'll start with yours because I think it's um, kind of central to where we are at the moment, and I kind of very much agree with the sketch you've given of a of the kind of 
the, 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 you know, the shift from a, a more hegemonic idea of, of the Indian nation towards regional political assertion, towards deepening political regionalization and the rise of regional parties towards a new form of um, uh, hegemonic idea. Um, and, you know, if, and I'm, you know, I think that's still an if, I'm not sure we've seen the end of caste as a, as a, as a form of regional assertion. Um, but, um, but I think there are probably new contours that we'll see emerging as well. And I think um, much of that may well crystallise around um, the, uh, the, the, kind of the, the questions that, will, that, may, that may arise from the next Finance Commission report, which will potentially disrupt um, the, uh, what has been for quite some time now been a fairly stable pattern of... Um, inter-regional redistribution. Um, so if we see a shift in the population formula that drives a change in the, the kind of in, in, um, in the weightage of uh, the richer southern states um, in favor of poorer northern states, um, uh, then I think it's quite likely that regional identity will merge with, a sen with, a, with potentially with quite anti-redistributive politics in southern states. Um, we already saw that. We've already seen the kind of the, the, the beginnings of that in, in Karnataka, in, in Andhra, in, um, to some extent in Telangana, um, but with you know, the argument that um, states that have higher tax capacity and are doing better um, should be allowed to retain more of their own tax revenues to <coughs> invest in their own priority um, priority initiatives, um, and that kind of regional claim will come into direct tension with the interests of the centre to increase its own fiscal space um, to push ahead with um, central government priority schemes. Um, and all of that within the context of an economic slowdown um, and macroeconomic pressures, which will also be felt, um, or are also already being felt, um, uh, in uh, in the fiscal you know, the, the fiscal capacity at both at both um, centre and state level. Um, so I think we may see some new forms of regional assertion, um, which. Uh, um, which have parallels in other federal systems and which, which will focus on, on questions of, of, distribution, of distributive tensions within um, at a, in, inter regional distributive tensions. Um, and Avani, maybe that's partly the answer to your question yeah. as well. Um, that uh, that um, in, you know, th there are important ways in which economic and fiscal. Um, developments um, will shape the um, political landscape. Um, you know, one says all of this against the backdrop of the 2019 elections in which we seem to have, um, you know, this, uh, kind of the, the, the relative absence of economic factors in shaping the, the voting decisions of... Um, of Indian citizens, citizens, but um, yet a series of state election results which would suggest that um, of state-specific factors and, and forms of economic discontent are still important um, in state elections. Um, and, you know, those will be important counter, counterweights to what's happening nationally. Um, And Vasavi, I think that actually, in, way, in a way, speaks to the question you're asking as well, in that um, there is absolutely an ebb and flow in, in federal practice between greater centralization and greater decentralization. Um, not a linear process, but a, but a more cyclical process than that. Um, and, I, and I think um, it, you know, it, that will continue to be the case. Um, uh, and you, know, you will continue to, to see states defining their own agendas um, in tension with or in opposition to what the central government's trying to do, working out the space in which they can state political leaders can claim the credit for what they're doing even when they are cooperating with the centre to implement its own programmes. Um, that kind of creative tension, if you like, between the centre and the states is, um, is, you know, is kind of the, the bread and butter of how um, federalism works in practice. Um, 
And the democratic socialism question is a, is a, is, is a poser. Um, and, um, I mean, you know, you, you're, you're picking up there. I mean, there's a lot of pessimism about federalism as a, as a political institution and the question as to whether it is the best institution for both um, uh, achieving economic growth or reducing inequality. I mean, there's good research on Latin America, for instance, which would suggest that federalism has contributed, contributed to increases in both interregional inequality and interpersonal inequality. Um, and there's a very long, well-established literature in, um, on the welfare state um, which would suggest that federalism does not produce a particularly hospitable environment to develop social, social, social democracies. Um, you know, that's partly because federalism itself helps to, frag to make it more difficult for class-based mobilisation. Um, it favours the organisation of in interests at the regional level. Um, and, um, you know, in, 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 in a good number of cases... Um, Federal institutions, because of the way in which they divide power, um, have made it more difficult to advance um, uh, kind of elements of welfare states. And, and those kinds of concerns actually also shaped the Indian constitution in, 19, in 1950. Um, that's part, you know, one of the reasons why um, you have a particular kind of um, centralism. Um, but I come back to the point I started with, really, which is that if you didn't have federalism here, um, you, 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 would, you, know, you, you would have all sorts of other problems which would equally imperil the, the challenge of, of how, do you, how do you grow the economy. There are a couple of other questions, so can I take those and then we'll mm -hmm. come back. So, Nekla, Praveen, Aruji, you had your hand up first and then we'll come back to um, Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you for writing the book. Um, I also have a clear, short text that we can get into a very complex theme with. But um, I, you know, I was just thinking as you were speaking, something around to institutions and time. But when I was going to be working at MP, and it was procurement season, uh, I was really surprised to see how hostile the local guys were to the FCI. So as soon as that Food Corporation of India came onto the platform, all of them sort of started defending the state civil supplies corporation. And you know, in the collectorate meeting, suddenly everybody was like, Apna Aulad Hamara, you know, like he's our guy. After all, you know, it's complete myths that state civil supplies corporation and market. There was this notion of, and I was really surprised because the FCI guy entered thinking he'd come to do everybody a favor. Now FCI has come into the market, and there was a lot of pushback. Uh, and yet they both had to settle down. It was also very interesting because farmers didn't recognize the food corporation at all. So did not want to sell to FBI. They also mixed, you know, they, they said this has come from outside. So it was a very interesting sort of just a moment uh, because procurement is really seen as a central scheme. It is very much seen as a central program where the state had a very different reaction to it and state agencies had a different reaction uh, here. And at the same time, here again, this is the other thing, sort of, there's a lot of pride in regional produce in markets. And at the same time, someone like the East Asian Prime Minister talked about how these commodities served as mnemonics for actually mapping the nation. Right? So it was actually about the movement of produce helped you think of the country, but also the regions in which it was coming. And so I was thinking particularly in the assembly of an economy the dynamics between all of these different layers, organizations, institutions, and then these very emotive objects, which are the commodities that actually flow between places and carry both a sense of a nation and of a particular place. Kashmir mm -hmm. has done this actually as an economic entity recently, the way in which people are talking about it. So anyway, I just have, you know, would really be interested to hear how you think about this sort of dynamic. Good afternoon. Uh, you would laid out what I thought was like some three very important points which I actually believe in. One is economic disparity in our states, which is widely limited. In fact, it might be a somewhat grave out here. Um, it's pretty much talked about political diversity, and it's talked about fiscal capitalism. 
I put all of these three together, I'm actually surprised at the optimism that you uh, exude about um, fed future federalism in India, given, I think, after the introduction of GST, I'm not sure how, you know, that's really hit all of us. The fact that an elected government in a state has no taxation powers. I don't know of any uh, democracy, and perhaps you know of this, maybe because of uh, research uh, history. I don't know how this, this could go. I'm elected, but I have no power to raise any revenues because direct taxes are controlled by uh, the central government that we call it. We don't call it the federal government instead, we call it the central government. Um, and indirect taxes are after GST. Something's going to get there, isn't it? So, that's for sure. Um, I have I think two questions. One of which relates to your last question Yamini asked. Actually, was hoping to throw a little further on your thoughts on the dynamics between federalism and decentralization. You seem to say that uh, that it was a more centralizing policy. Uh, so, to what extent do you think that the exercise of the state's federal rights has been kind of responsible for undermining that real that central um, idea of decentralization? Um, and the second question was relating uh, related to kind of um, the extent to which you think um, individuals uh, influence um, our institutional uh, ability to uphold federalism. So the completely um, our like the second wave of our centralizing uh, polity has has kind of been has revolved around Modi as a very centralizing figure who who kind of. Uh, holds authority in his own in his own person, and um, to what extent do you think our institutional arrangements of federalism are vulnerable to to um, individuals and their and what uh, what they view um, the federal structure should be or should not be? Thanks. You have a question. I like. I can. Okay. Sorry. Uh, my solution is that. Federalism was the right and natural choice, and it is here to stay in India. And I, I'm going to dwell on that, if you don't mind. I, I have little time, not much. Uh, it is because of that. <laughs> only a question. Only, 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 I, I won't take it long. It is because of the, the nature of diversity of this nation. Uh, it is a time and place. That's 1947 when we got freedom. The situation then and now is altogether different. Why we, we, we do, this is a new country where you have the, uh, all races and cross races, all cultures and cross cultures, all kind of weathers and all kind of vegetation, flora and fauna that you find all over the world. This sort of, then the languages, over 1,000 languages, and the people, and the, 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 the customs, the customary laws. You don't find that diversity anywhere in the world. I've been all over the world. You want that, that diversity that we have in this country. Now, how to keep this diversity together? There was no other way other than that we have next door the, 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 the theocratic state. Right? What's happening? Everything is going away except the theocrats over there. The we can't have dictators because our people won't accept the dictators. Right? But we have, we have in our constitution secular so social, socialist and democratic republic of India. Why some people have raised the questions over here? That's Sorry, why I asked. Okay. Secular, secular. secular we have to be secular because you know the reason. Socialist because there was Stalin and there was Mao in 1947. There was no choice but we have to go socialist. That was the reason. The federal. So I see the federal. Apart from federal, we have no other choice. We have to be federal. Federal is the way to stay. Thank you. Actually, that's a very Thank important you. point. Yes. <laughs> well made. <laughs> Should I take these? Yes. Yeah. So Mechel, it's a really interesting uh, kind of point about the flow of commodities across borders and the and and the 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 organisations or kind of arms of the state that are involved in in that flow. And food is, of course, a really a really important commodity. Um, and I and and in, Rahul's not here now, but may also emerge as one of the spaces where there's pushback from the states because. Food is, of course, you know, locally produced food is central to local political economies. Um, there has been over time, and I don't, I don't know whether Madhya Pradesh is, I think it's now a decentralized procurement state, isn't it? So, yeah, so I guess the FCI has 
no longer has that, um, that role. Um, but both the decentralization of, of public procurement, but also the more effective implementation of public distribution of food in many states, um, has really cemented the centrality of food um, in, in local political economies and, and local electoral contests. Um, so when we think about the kind of challenges to federalism in, in the present moment and um, the kind of the push towards one nation in all sorts of policy realms, we are also seeing this in, in, um, in food, um, and especially with the, the one nation, one ration card um, idea. Um, which, you know, of course, there are many reasons one might, might think that a one nation, one ration card is a good idea um, because, you know, the, the rights of interstate migrants has, have long been a kind of a concern when we, when we think about um, not only the PDS but also the, the functioning of the ration card as an identity document and so on. Um, so, but in other ways, this is likely to, and it already is, coming into direct collision um, with the politics of food. Um, and, you know, so far it's the DMK in, in Tamil Nadu that's been most vocal about this. Um, but there are, a, you know, many other states for whom I think um, this is likely to be very, very challenging. Um, Arissa is probably another very good example, but... Um, uh, in Chattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, we can, we can carry on naming the states that have invested heavily in, in, in these regional economies of food. But, um, you know, I, I think very interesting. And, you know, food is not the only place, I think, where there, you know, we may see more tensions emerging between central agencies and local agencies. Um, so, you know, Ujwala is another scheme that comes to mind where the central government has used central agencies to distribute gas cylinders. Um, Presumably to overcome, you know, constraints on or, you know, appetite among state governments to actually facilitate the rollout of Ujwala. Um, but, um, you know, if, you know, and, and the, you know, there are, there are other parts of the One Nation agenda, of course, um, uh, the increasing reliance on DBTs, direct benefit transfers, the alliance to... to Digital, which is also a centralised um, agenda. Um, so, in all sorts of ways, I think both the kind of flow of commodities, but also the agencies that distribute them, are going to disrupt local economies. Um, that um, you know, and, and those things are likely to feed into the continued specificity of state political and electoral um, agendas. Um, Probably, perhaps I've given you a kind of counter note there to suggest that I don't feel terribly optimistic at the moment about the state of federalism. Um, and She's gone from Britain. She's perhaps feeling optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel optimistic anywhere at the moment, but, yeah. but well, one has to hold on to the idea of federalism as, as being very you know, fundamental to, um, to the Indian polity. Um, and, um, you know... I, I, the point you make on taxation is extremely important, and I, and I and we don't yet ha really have a good political economy study of, of, of the GST or the GST Council, which really starts to to, to kind of probe these implications. Um, but um, you know, and there's probably a bigger discussion to be had about d distribution of taxation powers and and, and um, uh, their implications for um, for, for kind of. Uh, Subnational policy implementation and so on. Um, federalism and decentralisation, well, are the states responsible for undermining it? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I mean, it's useful to think um, in uh, comparative terms here, because I think internationally we've come through a great wave of decentralisation and, and a big push in the 1990s and early 2000s um, to decentralise to the third tier. Um, and um, that some of that push seems to have eased off, I think. And so it's not only in India that we're seeing agendas of re-centralisation and, and re-nationalisation. Um, but, um, but, you know, yes, I think Yamani made this point very well. Um, state governments have played a very important role in undermining the potential of, of, of um, 
of panchayats. Um, but allied to that also is, of course, a change in the kind of cent you know the, the kind of the, the the policy landscape at the centre. So things something like Narega was fundamentally important, really, for 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 boosting the. Um, the function and resources that were decentralised to, to panchayat level, um, but sorry, federalism and decentralisation. Um, I mean, I think not. No, not essentially. No. I'm going to completely misuse my position as, as chair and, and probe. Because Praveen, I think, has set us up on an interesting place. Uh, I, I think it might be really interesting to look at the, the very centralized fiscal structure that the Constitution gave us as well, which sort of over centralized taxation powers at the center, has meant that traditionally states have mostly tended to rely on devolution and grants in need. And even in a pre-GST era, there still are fundamental taxes that states should be collecting, property tax being a really important one, and states are pretty bad at that. Mm. Uh, so is there, did that create a perfect storm of an incentive structure for states to consistently push back and mobilize with against and with the center to receive more, rather than having to pay too much attention to its own taxation capability, which has sort of brought us to this place where center-state relations are always pressured around fiscal in a way where you eventually come back to the centralized uh, sort of structure as being the federal bargain. So, you know, for instance, even in the work that Avni and I did on the 14th Finance Commission, when states got their funds, uh, more devolution and had to, and, and centrally sponsored schemes were cut, they complained bitterly, having got exactly what they wanted mm. and have done everything in their power to try and recentralize all over again. And it's, it's just that that's why we title that paper the tug of war. It just seems like this. So you know, is is he, he has that old has a sort of continued way in which fiscal relations have been structured, created an incentive structure where states just always bargain with the center and don't really bother. So the relationship between taxing and federalism hasn't ever got established in our political system. Mm. Can I so, add to that? Yes. Mm. Actually, it's a very interesting question. I remember having a conversation along some lines with Arvind Subramanian when he was CEO and we introduced GST. And Arvind made this important point. No elected politician like wants to tax. Oh. So they're all very happy kicking up the taxation responsibility. Um, and instead just bargaining for more, for more funds. Having said all of this, there was really only one chief minister who actually wrote a dissent note against the idea of GST. That was the chief minister of Tamil Nadu, the late Yeah, that's true. Mm. So, so there, was, there was some of them who... But, but Praveen, so many states came up, uh, uh, finally agreed to join in GST because of their own fiscal ill health. So it was, it's falling back. I mean, uh, Kerala did it because they were in fiscal red. Agni uh, told me the story of how the finance secretary in Bihar said after they put the ban on uh, on alcohol, and GST compensation was a calculation. Um, you know, Yami, I would say how much of it was also political influence. Um, I always like Tamil Nadu as an example because the only <coughs> national political parties do not matter. Yeah, that's They've not mattered in 50 years. So not one of the two parties can exert any yeah. influence. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a little conflated with political pressure. Oh, uh, you know, in Kerala, for example, the Congress Party brought in GST, so if it was a Congress yeah. government, you couldn't see. Uh, but it's the really left that signed up for it. No. Perhaps, but the, the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was just going to point, Sorry. if you have the book in front of you, to a table on page 73, which um, I think gives quite an interesting picture on this, which is a, which is a yeah. table on the sources of state revenue. And it shows an incredible disparity across states um, in, in their reliance on grants from the centre compared to their own tax revenue. So you have, and, and, and this in an interesting way is also lays on top of um, a, the asymmetric design of fiscal transfers and of, of federalism more generally. So you have northeastern states, which, uh, which their, 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 their revenue between 5 and 15% of their revenue derives from their own taxes, um, and the, the, the rest of it comes from central taxes and grants from the centre. Um, 
compared to states like Maharashtra, Haryana, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, which, uh, you know, we're, we're over 60% of state revenue derives from own tax revenue. Um, so going back to the point I, I was making earlier about these kind of inter-regional distributive questions likely to emerge as, as flashpoints, this is exactly why. There's, you know, huge disparity between tax effort across states and the extent to which states are, are reliant on, on central grants. Um, and therefore the extent to which they rely on centre-state cent, cent, cent bargaining as well. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess we can take two more questions since, uh, since I uh, took up more time than I should have and was badly behaved. If there is any, sure, you can just have your last. You know, uh, when we uh, talk about uh, capitalism, then there is uh, another thing the national identity is also missing, like in European state, EU, then we have uh, like uh, Russian global and other conglomerates that come up, like America is holding to Germans and Japanese defense now. So my question is that uh, the migration for people who migrate to one of the best education to get the best of the uh, free, and they are being uh, uh, hailed as a professional, how far the education could be successful in creating capitalism and nationalism and when technology is rapidly increasing, do you feel the, uh, the nationalism will disintegrate to some extent and some sort of globalization or some sort of uh, regionalism or a power structure could hold the nationalism to its center? It's a big question. But... <laughs> yes. Sorry, there's one last question there. That's yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, you made a point uh, with respect to the fact that uh, if there is a majority Indian government at the center, it might have certain effect on the federalizing uh, tendency uh, in the country. So uh, I was just wondering, I mean, uh, if you uh, uh, look since independence, the evolution federalism had in India, uh, don't you think there is a causality between party system and uh, federalizing tendency, whether it results in uh, lessening of the federalizing tendency or for that matter, deepening of the federalizing tendency, I mean, uh, something, an area that we need to have a nuanced exploration on. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Just wanted to pick up something you mentioned briefly, which was um, about growing regioni regionalization during the 90s, and how that sort of also went with um, stronger centralizing leaders at the state level. And I wanted to ask whether you think you know, what we're seeing now with Modi is almost an upwards corrosion of that same tendency, like these authoritarian tendencies that have been around at the state level for decades now, but now we're seeing it at a national level. And is there something about the structure of Indian federalism that predisposed um, sort of regional power towards these kind of authoritarian? Yeah. Let me take the, the, the last question um, first. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an important political economy dimension to the emergence of strong centralized leaders at the, at the state level, um, which also relates to their ability to um, capture resource, um, both in order to fund political campaigns, but um, well, most importantly, is their ability to fund political campaigns, but which which relates not only to, to sources of licit finance, but you know illicit finance and, and sources of, of of political party finance um, at the state level, um, which links back to something I was also alluding to when we think about the role of federalism in in governing the economy and how that rubs up against the informality of of local political economic arrangements and you know something that has has gone in parallel with the process of economic liberalization from the center has been the re-regulation of the economy at the state level. Um, so that re-regulation places important resources in the hands of chief ministers and all of that feeds into um, the kind of centralization that we've seen of, of, of political leadership at the state level. Um, and yes, one might well say that that pattern <laughs> has migrated um, to, to the central level and that there is some connection to the, um, the nature of capitalism. Um, in, in the current moment. Um, um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think on party system, absolutely. I think 
in everything I'm arguing in the book and have kind of been saying here, I've been absolutely agree with um, the, the shape of the party system, the trends in terms of regionalisation, greater nationalisation, whether whether one party has a has a majority in parliament at the centre, um, are all absolutely critical for shaping the, the kind of nature of, of, of federalism as praxis um, across time, and that's you know part of the reason why we see these ebbs and ebbs and flows. Um, and I might duck your question, but maybe we could talk over tea. <laughs> <laughs> well, Louise, thank you very, very much. As, as, as expected, this was insightful, thought-provoking, and really, I think, given uh, the state of our politics, um, we couldn't have a more important conversation. So I hope this is the first of many more. Thank you. Thank you.